I'm really excited to see uh, some fresh perspective take over and help the community grow in some really wonderful ways. Um, before I do that, I have a couple of thank yous I have to issue um, here first. So first and foremost, I want to thank you all um, for seven and a half years. You've been coming month after month and sending tweets and Instagramming and uh, riding through the bad talks and enjoying the good talks. And um, quite frankly, it's um, like it's been an amazing experience for me. And I, I feel uh, Seattle specifically is a, is a really special place in the world today. Um, and this this community and the support that we have here, I think, uh, certainly proves that. So thank you all very much for that. Um, secondly, I want to make sure that I mention Jeremy Wheat. Jeremy. <laughs> Um, quite frankly, Jeremy is, is the engine that has enabled Good Mornings to happen um, with any degree of consistency um, for the last uh, you know, four or five years or something. Three, three, four, it feels like ten. <laughs> um, Bob and Bob Mark, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and fortunately for you guys, Jeremy's sticking around, so um, that's good news, I think. Okay, so. Let's talk about the exciting part. Um, Jeremy Beasley, we spent some time talking to folks uh, when I made the decision to step down and looked at, at a number of people out there, um, several of whom seemed like they were the right people um, in my perspective. Um, and I couldn't be more excited that Jeremy is taking this over. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Jeremy is a UX designer and product director at Intentional Futures here in Seattle. Uh, he's been a member of the Creative Mornings organizing team for a long time now. Um, and he's also a mentor to grad students at UW and volunteers at TAF and at Code.org. He's also expecting a baby in like four or five minutes or something. <laughs> um, so he's, he's got a lot going on. Um, so we're really fortunate that he uh, is willing to kind of step up and take this over. Um, he's one of the most thoughtful people I've had the pleasure of getting to know. Brilliant thinker, an incredible creative person, and I'm um, super excited to see where he takes things. It's going to be really, really cool. So, um, I'm going to introduce Jeremy and then let Jeremy introduce his new guest. Jeremy Beasley. So, uh, we're excited this morning to have Callie Pitchell Smith and Brian McDonald with us this month. Uh, Callie started as uh, Belief, Callie started at Belief Agency as a copy director. Uh, after spending a few years there, she left to run marketing on the brand side uh, before boomeranging back to Belief Agency as a creative director, uh, where she also manages their marketing efforts and consulting arm. Uh, so, Brian, partner in crime, uh, chief storyteller at Belief Agency. Uh, his career spans film, TV, uh, and comic books. He's collaborated with a range of partners, including Hollywood Studios, uh, Soap du Soleil, and Interactive. 
Uh, his book on story construction, Invisible Ink, is required reading at Pixar. Uh, so we're excited to have Kelly and Brian with us uh, this morning. Uh, please give them a warm welcome. So when you think about uh, symmetry in terms of, is it still doing it? <laughs> okay. Right. I got it. I got it. That was suspense. I was adding suspense. Another storytelling tool. Um, so uh, it's really a matter of balance when you're talking about stories. How does the story balance? Um, when you're in the hands of a storyteller who really knows what they're doing, um, there is a sense of, um, well, there's a sense of symmetry. So, um, look, I'll, I'll define what the React structure is so you know what that is, and then because it'll come up from time to time. So, uh, the React structure, uh, which is often called Aristotelian structure because Aristotle was sort of the first person to define it, um, where he talked about the beginning, middle, and end. And people go, oh, that's what a story is. It's like, that's not really what a story is, but. Um, the beginning, middle, and end, uh, one way to think of it is, um, tell, which you've probably heard before, with writing a paper or giving a speech, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them, right? Um, and the reason that works in a story is because that's the way we talk, that's the way people speak, right? So you'll say, Saturday, I was at the best party I've ever been to, right? That's what I'm going to tell you. Then I'm going to prove that somehow. I'm going to give you all my evidence for that. And then I'm going to come back around and go, oh my God, what a great party, whatever it is. And that's the symmetry of the story. Uh, you usually come back around to the beginning of the end. So, what was my question? <laughs> How do you define symmetry? Oh, well, then I think I answered that question. You did. Right. <laughs> oh, man, that's right. <laughs> this is just about me. <laughs> I don't know if I like this. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, how do you find, define symmetry in the context of a brain? That's a great question, Brian. <laughs> Kelly wrote the question. <laughs> Get that out the open. Yeah, so I think you can't talk about symmetry and brand if you don't think first about the consumer and how your the consumer experiences your brand. Um, so I'm not going to talk about like a word mark and its symmetry or a logo and its symmetry, but really more about um, we like to talk to our clients about the difference between. Oh yeah, should we talk for one moment about what we do? Or I guess we'll maybe get there. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah, We're a full-service okay. creative agency. Uh, we believe the truth is enough, and our purpose is to prove to our clients and to our industry that you can tell the truth and make money. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so I think so. We talk to our clients a lot about the difference between being and doing. So you can be a brand who likes to talk about toxic masculinity, but uh, if you're not a brand that's doing anything about toxic masculinity then you render yourself inauthentic in the market. Um, I was gonna hold off on this example until later, but I might as well get started. Um, who saw the Gillette ad? Great, who liked the Gillette ad? Ooh, great, oh, okay, okay, it's fine. Um, you're not gonna like it after this, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, 
So at first blush, um, I really I thought I thought they were doing something interesting. In fact, because of what we do, we're it's kind of one of our core competencies is storytelling and doing kind of documentary style content. So a lot of people started texting us. I'm sure everybody from Belief can also say, "Have you did you see the Gillette ad?" With like excitement, like we would love it. And so I think I loved it the first time I saw it, uh, and then I watched it again, and then I watched it again, and I was curious, what does power look like? At like Gillette, if they're going to talk about toxic masculinity. Uh, so I did a little Googling and I saw that their executive team, their board of directors, and their entire advisory board are all men. So they have a really narrow definition of what power looks like at Gillette. Uh, so I would say that that's an asymmetrical brand in that they are articulating this belief in the market about dismantling toxic masculinity. However, they are upholding some really conventional ideas about power internally. Uh, and the, the problem with the power that the consumer has now, which is access to lots of information, is that, that the, the consumer will find out. Uh, and they'll you know, either, because they disagree with you, flush your razor down the toilet, which is asinine, but whatever. Um, uh, or they'll go to your competitor, or whatever. Um, so that idea of symmetry kind of put most simply is, are you doing the things you say that you are versus just saying that you're a certain thing? That makes sense? It made perfect <laughs> sense. Okay, great. It made perfect sense. Oh, okay. So next question is for Brian. Um, we didn't cover this in the first question, but okay. I'd like for you to talk a little bit about armature okay. and how that, why that's important and how that influences the kind of balance and consistency of the story. Okay, so... An armature in the story. So, uh, early on in my career, I worked in creature shops um, in Los Angeles. Uh, this was 1986. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I think I was born right around. Yeah, yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, in these creature shops, uh, we made a lot of monsters and zombies and stuff. And uh, I, I was a low person on the total block. But I got to watch these sculptors make these little maquettes of whatever alien or monster or whatever. It was amazing to watch these really beautiful sculptures they could make. But they would have to make uh, an armature first. They would have to make a skeleton first because the clay could support its own weight in a, an hour or two or a day and it would collapse. And in a story, um, you have an armature. And that armature is your point. And everything comes from that point. So you start with what you want to say. So um, in a story, like I said, the proposal, uh, uh, or the tell them you're gonna tell them. The other way to think about the tell them what you're gonna tell them thing is um, proposal, Saturday was the best party I've ever been to, argument, all your proof, right? Conclusion, oh my God, that, would have, that was a great party, right? So your proposal is your armature. I'm going to be telling you this. And every decision you make should come from that place. Every decision you make should come from that place. So that's an armature. So, did you have, what was? I think, well, I think we'll. Great, okay, so in a brand, in a brand, what's Perfect. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I didn't even read that, that was just. <laughs> uh, sure, so uh, when we think about brand consistency, and symmetry, quite frankly, in the way that the consumer experiences your brand, um, we like to say that your belief, what you believe, is your first and your strongest differentiation in the market. Uh, people stopped buying products a long time ago. Um, we went from being like people with needs, we bought a pair of pantyhose because they were sturdy, uh, to being consumers with desires, we bought a pair of pantyhose because they made it like, look long and sexy, uh, and now we are... Uh, we're seeing what Edelman is calling the belief-driven buyer, the emergence of the belief-driven buyer. Our trust in institutions is eroding. Uh, what? Po <laughs> um, politics, religion. Um, the, there's lots of kind of research that suggests, um, even on kind of some of the Gallup polling, where like the clergy and politicians are just kind of like landsliding down the list in consumer trust and. Um, in part because we have, like, 
for the first question, we have access to more information than we've ever had before. And um, we've also been able to kind of splinter into these tribes. We used to have to orient around things like ethnic groups and religion, and now we can orient around our love for, you know, nonprofit coffee shops. And um, so the consumer wants more. We value things like trust and transparency over price and um, product features uh, overwhelmingly. And so if you think you can just be a product, then you're just a commodity, and it's a race to the bottom. Where can I get this coffee cheaper? Because uh, you probably get it for really cheap at like 7-Eleven, and it's probably okay. And nobody wants to admit that the coffee's okay, but it's better than Starbucks, so. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm not making any friends today. <laughs> um, I'm not speaking on behalf of my employer. <laughs> strategy, like an armature, it should be the filter through which you make all of your decisions. Uh, so we believe the truth is enough. Uh, that's going to impact the way in which we talk to our clients. We tell our clients the truth as an act of service, and sometimes that's hard. Um, we expose a lot of our operational um, kind of inner workings of, across the business. You don't have to be in the executive team to, to kind of get that transparency across the way in which we operate. Um, it, it's and the nice the thing about having a belief or an armature in the context of a story is a, a storyteller, but in the context of a brand, what you don't want is a single person to be the arbiter of your brand. Um, that if you have to make a decision, you have to go ask Tom, because uh, it's probably a Tom. And Tom is left crying. So having that belief, one, ensures that consistency, two, spreads that decision making to the edges and gives you that symphony. So whether you're writing a tweet or you're making a feature length film or you're um, writing a script, funneling it all through that belief is what ensures that consistency and it's your differentiation. Uh, so that's my answer. Good answer. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, what are some of the other components of storytelling that reinforce structure and symmetry? Um, well, there are a couple of things. One is um, there's something uh, called a charged object. Um, well, I call it a charged object. Um, I, I stole that uh, name from um, psychics. So psychics, like if they, uh, like, oh, this is the, you know, the gun from the murder scene, and they, you know, they can do their psychic thing from the gun. Um, because it's charged, right? So, uh, in a story you have charged objects, and they can be very powerful in stories. So, um, or in life you have charged objects. In fact, you can have charged places, like, um, this space, not this space, but this general area is very charged for me. One of my very best friends, uh, when, um, growing up, had his first apartment just over here. He's, he's not alive anymore. His first apartment was walking this So, I can't come around here without thinking about them. Or in the uh, in the 1970s, I saw the Jackson Five uh, at the, the arena uh, with my family. It was not alive. I know. <laughs> Nobody was. Just me. I was the only person. I get it. I get it. <laughs> you were 25. Oh, good. Okay, good. Good. I feel better now. Thank you. That's good. Um, and so this, this area becomes very charged for you. And you can charge an object for, in, in a story so you could have, um, let's say, um, a character had a pair of glasses or something and they, and they passed on and maybe their kid has the glasses. And every time you would show that person with those glasses or holding those glasses or looking at those glasses, you'd go, oh, they're thinking about their, oh, their, right? And it, it creates emotion. So charged objects have you could, symmetry plays in because those charged object, objects can come back in special places, right? So that's one way you have symmetry uh, with stories. The other thing is you have clone characters. And clone characters are um, characters that, um, they're sort of a yardstick. So you can measure characters against each other. So you can't have in a story, for instance, a good cop without having a bad cop or a bunch of bad there's a movie called Serpico, which no one's seen except you. Um, uh, 
<laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I look for the gray hair and they're all like, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's about uh, a cop in New York. It's a true story. It's about a cop in New York who's a, a good cop in a corrupt system. And he looks better when you see how corrupt all the other police officers are. Those are clones. And so, um, and so sometimes you can use uh, clones to uh, replay a scene or reflect a scene or reflect a situation back to a character or back to the audience. And that's, um, that's one way you can use uh, uh, symmetry uh, in a story to use one character. Yeah. I don't know. You have a question. I'm not good at that. <laughs> um, well, it's okay. I'll just follow up with the same. Can you? Yeah. Wait, wait. No, oh, look, I don't, I don't have a question. No, that's the question. Oh, okay. What I just answered? Yeah. <laughs> Most of it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I'll talk about charged objects and clone characters in the context of brand. Uh, so, uh, so just like with just, that, all makes sense for everyone, right? So if you, you can, it's pretty easy to start to kind of make some, draw some analogous, um, kind of make some comparisons to brands. So think about logos. Um, even with watching kind of the evolution of the Mastercard logo, they've gone, they dropped the word mark. Now it's like just super iconic, and so uh, it could be brand colors. So one of our uh, one of our clients is Dun Lumber, and they have this Dun Lumber blue, and uh, it, it's it's a very kind of potent symbol of not get too close. Um, very potent symbol of their brand. And when you see that color blue, or at least when we do, you know it it it, it means something to us. It it means trust. It means um, building success together. And um, you can see this. It, kind of applies also with things like jingles or little picky taglines. Uh, I know millennials aren't eating cereal anymore, apparently. I just saw, I just read that. Um, but, uh, which, I don't know, does it make sense to me? I guess it's a lot of work or something to make cereal. Um, and, um, but I, I think about kind of uh, a lot of the advertising when I was a kid, watching cartoons, a lot of it's cereal. And so I still remember, like, God, how my pops and, you know, like, all these things, they become kind of charged in, in uh, even kind of music that's associated with uh, commercials and things like that. Um, and it's also a really powerful tool in the, the storytelling of your brand. So if you are making a spa or explainer video, kind of always that, that end card being whatever that symbol or image is that you want people to kind of associate with your brand, whether it's a color or your logo. Um, and as far as clone characters go, it would probably be easy to say, oh, well, your, your competitors are your clone characters, which is, I think is a, a lazy form of advertising. So I'm not going to use that as an example. Um, but if you think, did anybody see the Microsoft spot with the adaptive controller, Owen? So they played the one at the Super Bowl, but there's a spot that preceded that that's a little bit more kind of, uh, I don't know, narrative. Uh, and. Uh, you see, before you get into Owen's house where all the boys are playing together, you see boys riding their bikes down the street, and you see them running down the street. You see them with their regular controllers, and um, those are all clones to Owen, right? So you're building that contrast between all these things that these other little boys are able to do and the limitations um, based on Owen's level of ability. Uh, and so that those clone characters in that spot in particular really build, help build that tension and that contrast, and then you get that payoff, that, that really beautiful payoff in the end where you get to see, you know, everyone gets to play. Um, so that's just an example of clone characters. And we have run out of questions. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, I just want to add to the idea of contrast, because um, contrast is, there's a great book called um, uh, How Pictures Work by a woman named Molly Bang. And it's a really great book. And in there, she talks about how contrast is how we see. We can't see anything without contrast, right? So, so what you were talking about, right? With uh, you have the the um, the kid with uh, disability and the kids riding their bikes or whatever. That contrast helps us see, right? It allows us to see. Um, it's a mistake people often make. They don't understand that that's how we see, so they forget the contrast. So I'm glad you brought that up. The um, contrast was I forgot to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> see how that works? Um, I think, Brian, I have a couple questions for you. All right. Um, just since we probably have time. As long as we have time for my song. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to dance. <laughs> um, I think. 
Kwan character is really interesting. Um, and one of the stories, or one of the examples that you used in explaining to us is, um, that makes it really, really clear for me, is uh, the Wizard of Oz. Mm. Can you talk oh, a little uh, bit about sure. the characters in the Wizard of Oz? Right, so uh, often when I ask people, another way to think about armature is theme. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, I don't start with that word because people have different definitions for the word theme, but as long as we now know it's armature, I can talk about it. So if we want to ask people what the armature and the theme of the Wizard of Oz is, the answer I often get is, well, there's no place like that. <laughs> but you have to look at what the story proves. The story doesn't prove that exactly. It proves that on one level, but it doesn't prove it exactly. What it proves is that we may already have what we're looking for. And the way you see that is through all the clone characters. So you, the Scarecrow is looking for a brain, but has a brain the entire time. Right? So when Dorothy runs into the Scarecrow for the first time, and he's talking about getting off the pole, and he doesn't, can't get off the pole, and she, she wants to help him, and she doesn't know how, he says, well, I'm not right about doing things, but if you just spin the nail, maybe I'll, I'll slip off. Right? So he had to come up with a solution. She couldn't, because he has to demonstrate the whole time that he has a brain. He's the only character in the whole piece who comes up with any plans. Nobody else comes up with plans, only he does. You're going to be off your armature if the lion comes up with plans. Right? So it's always the Tin Man who's crying, right? Um, it's, it's, the, it's the lion who's like, okay, I'll go in there for Dorothy. I'm scared, but I'll go in there. I'll do it anyway, right? So, um, uh, what was the question? Did I answer the question? Yes, I think so. Oh, yeah. I just think it's really, it really illuminates the kind of, when done well, what characters can do for your story. Yeah, oh, and I want to talk a little bit about callbacks. We didn't really get to it, but callbacks or playbacks are, um, it's a little like a charged object, but it's a charged um, situation. It could be a music cue, it could be a lot of things. So, for instance, in E.T., um, in E.T., E.T. is learning how to talk for the first time, and he's watching Sesame Street, right? And, uh, well, Gertie's watching Sesame Street, the little girl, and, and E.T. is sort of near the TV, and uh, the cartoon on Sesame Street is about the letter B. And uh, E.T. hasn't talked the whole movie, and then all of a sudden he says, B. <laughs> and she, she says, <laughs> uh, And she says, you said B, good. And he says, B, good, right? At the end of the movie, when he's leaving and saying goodbye, he says to Gertie, be good. We hear be good. But that callback is to the Sesame Street show. Right? Hey, remember when we had that moment together? It was really what he's saying. But we hear what you often say to a kid, hey, be good. It's really, that's a really nice use of the callback. Um, and those are very powerful. Because what happens is, I actually heard it described by a dancer once that the, the movements become your friend. So, become the audience's friend. So that when there's a movement early on, and then that movement comes back, there's a, there's a sense of like, oh, that's that thing again. That's a kind of symmetry. Oh, that's that thing. I recognize that thing. I recognize be good. I recognize this movement. I recognize that music cue. Um, really good. There's a really good music cue in. Um, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where uh, the way John Williams scored that is um, a lot of times characters have themes. Uh, Marion in, in, uh, in Raiders of the Lost Ark doesn't have a theme. Uh, Marion and Indy have a theme when they're together. So they have a musical theme when they're together. When, he, when Indiana Jones thinks that Marion is dead and he's sitting at a bar and he's drinking, that theme plays underneath. What's he thinking about? Oh, he's thinking about her, and you have a response. Really? Okay, so the question is, um, and I'm going to summarize. Basically, if you're working somewhere where there's not a lot of buy-in around the way in which you're selling your goods or services, when it's kind of product-specific selling, how would you make a case internally uh, for kind of pivoting that messaging? Well, you hire us. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think, so this is something that we've been doing for about, in May it'll be seven years, and so we're kind of like waiting. Now that this language has kind of emerged and um, there's all this data 
that supports it. And so for us, we were kind of going off of intuition and what felt right, but now we've got all this data to substantiate that this is what the consumer wants. And so if you have to try to sell it in, there's, I'm, I'd be happy to talk with you after and share some of the research, but Edelman has a great, it's called the Earned Brand Report, they're, and they're not the only ones. Um, there's plenty um, of research uh, that suggests that this is the better way to sell, and um, it's also kind of a more conscious symbol, I can't say that word, you know what I mean though, um, way to sell. Uh, one of the things that we talk about also is this idea of operationalizing the truth, and that's just another way to talk about symmetry. Um, and so if you, you can, it's not just about positioning yourself in the market. If you are not then operationalizing that belief internally, it is only strategic. And when you start with strategy, like, oh, well, the millennials want us to care about something, so we need to care about something. Um, and by the way, it's not just millennials. It's every category of buyer, every age, every income, all are wanting to buy products that make them feel good, that make them feel like they, if we cannot vote, <laughs> Uh, fairly, uh, then how can we vote with our wallets? And how can we um, really, through our buying power, affect change in our communities? Like going to Street Bean instead of Starbucks, for example. Um, we all have that agency to make that decision. Um, but if you haven't, uh, it's not enough to just talk about it. Um, because if you just talk about it like Gillette, like Pepsi, who tried to solve the world's problems with Kendall Jenner and a can of Pepsi, um, you know, that, they pulled that spot in two minutes. How much money did they waste? You know, they don't, Pepsi doesn't care about that. Um, if Pepsi had this long tradition of investing in kind of social movements and uh, supporting social consciousness, then sure, you can solve a problem with a Pepsi. Um, but it's just inconsistent. So it's one thing to talk about it and sell that in internally, but what are you guys doing? You're not just being purpose-driven, but you're doing things with purpose. Very different. So we, you know, our kind of core competency is creative, and we do films and social content and blog content, and we help build brands with conviction, right? Um, but oftentimes when we're having these conversations with our clients, we're sitting with the C-suite. And so we are not just sitting with the marketing team, we're also talking to the HR lead, and we're talking to a CEO. And that alignment, we start there. It ha there has to be alignment. Otherwise, go find somebody else. Somebody else can make you a purpose-driven ad spot. But if you really want to fundamentally change your business and you want to um, kind of just run that consistently from every every experience in your brand, not just for the consumer, but for your employees, um, it, I mean, it really, it just starts at the top, I guess, is kind of the, the, the easy way out. <laughs> data to inform creative, how do you, um, what's, what, I guess, how do you make a case uh, for leading with story and leading with belief? Um, data is really important, and I'm not going to say that it's not, because that's not true, um, but it should never dictate your strategy, it should never dictate your message. Um, and I'll just go back to that Pepsi example. So at the time, Kendall Jenner was the highest paid supermodel in the world, I think she probably still is, um, which is a shame, because if you see her walk a runway, it's very sad. Um, watch my Naomi Campbell walk a runway and then tell me if Kendall Jenner should be the highest paid supermodel. Um, and so at the time, I was also kind of the crescendo of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and again, this kind of millennials are socially conscious. So if you look at the data, Pepsi looked at the data, well, of course you could make that spot, right? Um, however, <laughs> 
you know, in its situated in its context and the legacy of their brand, it made no sense. Um, it was, uh, quite frankly, uh, condescending to the consumer. And um, it hurt their brand. Um, and it hurt Kendall Jenner's brand. She cried about it on Keeping Up With The Kardashians. So um, maybe it didn't hurt her brand, I don't know. The ephemera of the, the age, but um, so I would say, you know, data is important and it should tell you, and maybe it does tell you that your 90 second spot, people are dropping off at 60 and you should recut it. Or maybe it tells you you should do it on a blue background instead of a red background. And maybe it tells you you should do it at 12 in the afternoon instead of 12 in the morning. Um, but it should not drive your messaging because it will render you inauthentic. Um, for what? I also think that you can, um, you can prove your case. If you move people with what you do, like people, they think they know what they want until you show them something that they really do want, and they think that you gave them what they asked for, right? So <laughs> we, we just did we just did a job like that. I won't say for who we did it for, but we just did a job, a job like that where we gave them what they thought they asked for, and they moved, we moved them so they were fine. So I would say do the best work that you know how to do and they will respond accordingly. And that's gonna be your best case because it's just abstract. If you talk about it in the abstract and they can't get it, they're never, they're never gonna get it. Um, if you have time, do your version in, therefore, right? But, you know, sometimes you just have to go out there and be brave and go this, I'm, I'm gonna give you my best work. And often people respond to it. They don't usually say no. I also think that um, thinking that you have to make short content, I think, is more a kind of symptom of bad content being made in short form. And so you can make a seven minute spot and people will watch 88% of it. Um, but if you make a really bad 30 second spot, you're going to get people dropping off in the first five seconds. So I think it's more than anything, it's the quality of the content. If you're if you're kind of obsessed with telling a, a true story, people will watch it. Yeah. And the data that the data shows that us that with our clients, we made a series of kind of financial literacy and money management content um, for one of our clients, and uh, they're about 120 seconds, um, and we get. The, our, the average um, view completion is, is upwards of 90%. And sometimes we're serving these up as ads. I don't know if anybody's seen a masterclass ad. I will watch that all the way to the end, every time. They're excellent. So I think, you know, it's, hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Find that a little bit. What do you mean against all odds? Like it broke convention somehow. You would never think it would get past the pitch. In fact, you can't even imagine. How did anybody pitch this? It was pitch. It doesn't have to be or it has to be. You know what's interesting is that um, when something works, it never seems like it was ever unconventional. Like of course you would do that, right? Of course you would. Um, so I bet you almost everything that works, um, in fact, I've seen that a lot. So what happens is if you're doing something special, often you'll get a lot of pushback because it doesn't feel like everything else. And people get nervous when something doesn't feel like everything else. People will make decisions. But your audience understands what you're doing. So, um, against all odds really means, I guess, uh, yeah, convincing the people in power <laughs> that this is a good idea. But once it's done, it usually just seems like, of course, you would make this movie. But, you know, people weren't sitting around waiting for Star Wars to come out. You know? They weren't, they weren't sitting around, you see it now, you're like, of course, Star Wars. But nobody was waiting for it to come out. Nobody's waiting for Jaws to come out, right? So um, 
you know, that's something that probably really surprised me uh, behind that movie. I mean, they wanted to fire Spielberg and all of that, right? They wanted to fire Coppola and The Godfather, right? They wanted to, you know, so, um, but that's the power of people, the audience do. And it doesn't seem like a risk to us, us when we see it. So, uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but I just think it, once it's done, it feels right. Oh, always got drunk and drunk. Oh, right. Oh, drunk. Oh, okay. That was cool, right? Uh huh. And then mad mothers again, drunk driving came along, and all of a sudden society here really changed. People still drive drunk, right? But nobody thinks it's cool anymore. And how did they do that? How did how did they change that? Yeah, I mean, well, obviously driving drunk. And Right. But having being heavily armed and killing children is also a bad thing. We haven't gotten past that. What did they do that nobody else was doing? Oh. I I think that they told a really compelling story. Um, and I'm I I mean I don't I, I think that they were able to kind of capture the narrative in a way that maybe nobody had heard before, or given people a new lens for understanding the dangers of drunk driving. Um, as far as like guns go, I I, I feel hopeless, so I, I can't, I mean, I wish I had something illuminating to say. <laughs> there probably, there was no, you know, there was no big business making money off people drinking and driving. Right? Um, not the same way there is with guns, right? We did, they did, there was no sort of NRA for drinking in front of it. And so, and so, um, right? And so I think that's part of it. It's the, it's the money sort of winning. That's what's happening. Uh, but a good enough story will change it. The right story will change it. It changes everything. A good enough story changes the world. You, you know. Um, 
I don't think, I mean, I don't know, is he still sponsored by Nike? Sure, that's a great point, right? That's a, yeah, that's a great point. So don't shop there, right? You know, like if you, right? You know, you have the power to not uh, patronize these brands that you, right? That's our power as consumers at this point. Like nobody can take that away from you. Um, and so when you see those, when you have that asymmetrical experience with the brands, like, we get to decide how we respond. Can we end on a lighter note? <laughs> Just real quick. Absolutely, and so it makes me think of things like when CVS um, came out with their Health is Everything campaign and they stopped selling cigarettes. Um, you know, it's like you have to, this is not just about the way you face the market. Um, if you talk about, say you believe in, uh, you know, we believe everybody's at their best when they have what they need and you don't provide health benefits to your employees, which I think is illegal, but you know, whatever. I can't, you know, just kind of pulling something out of my pocket. Um, that consistency is really important, and yes, we do talk to our clients about that. And what it what it becomes is a filter through making a filter through which you make your decisions. If it doesn't for us, if it's not honest, we won't do it. Um, and so, I I would kind of encourage any brand to say to have that question, right? Like for Dunlumber, does it build trust? And if it doesn't build trust, then easy, we don't do it. It takes all gut trend, you know, all of that out of the decision making. Is it laddering back up to what we believe so that we be, can be consistent and symmetrical in the market? Then yes. Move past go. <laughs> All right, folks. Thanks for a great conversation. Uh, <laughs>